Let's open up our book, Bibles to the book of Acts. We actually ended on a cliffhanger last week. Peter and John were thrown into detention or some sort of prison. And we pick up the story in Acts chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 5. I love the book of Acts because not only do you get good theological teaching and instruction, but you also get a lot of narrative. And so it's fun to be able to have um, both of these things combined. So last week we saw that, that Peter and John, through the power of the name of Jesus, healed the lame man who had been lame for his whole life. He was 40 years old. And because of th this event, there a crowd formed. Peter preached. He uplifted the name of Jesus. And that got him into trouble. And he got arrested, so to speak, by the uh, people there at the temple, the leaders at the temple. So Peter and John were in custody overnight. Meanwhile, uh, the church is growing, and interest is increasing in what is happening, because people are seeing there is power in the name of Jesus. So Acts chapter 4, verse 5, it says this, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, these are the three branches or parts of the Sanhedrin. These were essentially the supreme court of the land, and there were maybe up to 71 of them altogether. But there were elders, there were rulers, and there were scribes, as well as, who, who's, who's next in the narrative? Annas, the high priest. Now, Annas was not actually high priest during that time. He had stopped being high priest about 16 AD. But this guy had so much power, in fact, five of his sons went on to become high priest, that he basically is this grandfather or godfather type figure in the background that's still pulling the levers and is still considered high priest, even though he's not high priest during this time. But he, along with Caiaphas, were the two main guys that helped put Jesus on the cross as far as from the religious side of things. So those guys are there. Now think about that. You're Peter. You know who put Jesus on the cross and who killed Jesus. And now those two power brokers are right there, along with uh, perhaps 69 other, 71 people, perhaps all together, the most powerful religious people in the nation are right there, and you're in front of them. They perhaps were arranged in a semicircle, and Peter and John are standing there with all of them looking at them. And then there's also John and Alexander. We, don't, we know less about who these people were. And then it says, as and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Verse 7, And when they had set them in their midst, so they're right there in front of them, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Now earlier we saw Jesus promise, You shall wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power. And we said that Greek word was dunamis. So the, the religious leaders are saying, what kind of dunamis, what kind of dynamite, what kind of power are you using? Is it good? Is it dark? Is it evil? Is it from God? Now, obviously, they didn't think it was from God, or they hoped it wasn't. And then by what name? And last week, we saw that Peter proclaimed the name of Jesus. Um, and as you recall, there were people who, uh, we've talked about this a little bit before, even among the Jews who, who didn't believe in Jesus, there were people who tried to cast out demons. Uh, they were exorcists, and they used the most powerful names that they could to try to cast out demons. In fact, I read about one person who was trying to use the name of Solomon to, to work miracles. I don't know that he was very successful, but, but, but what, what name are you using to, to work these miracles? And if you're Peter or John, you're thinking... You set this up perfectly, right? Like these jokes, it's just set up perfectly for another inspiring sermon, although he gives it a mini sermon here. And essentially, you'll see, he's going to say what he shared the day before in summary. How have you done these things? Verse 8, then Peter, and what happened to Peter in verse 8? Filled 
with the Holy Spirit. Now, he had already been filled, but again, this, there's this extra infilling that happens. This boost, it may be like in a car that is, you know, supercharged. He, he gets a, a boost of nitro or something similar um, for, um, for this mission. So Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, he said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Now again, he's talking to the people who killed partly Jesus, but remember all of us killed Jesus. But these are the religious leaders that had the power to put Christ on the cross. And if you're Peter, this would be scary. But he was filled with the Spirit, and as we'll talk about today, one of the gifts of the Spirit is boldness. We don't often talk about this gift, but it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And so Peter, who had denied Jesus three times not that long ago, now stands there not knowing if the people are going to put him on a cross after this moment, and he begins to say some pretty bold words. Verse 9, If this day we are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, We've done something good for someone that was helpless. By what means he has been made whole, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by whom you crucified, God raised up from the dead. By him, this man stands here before you whole. So again, like we saw last time, there's a question. Well, how did this happen? Answer, there's somebody named Jesus, and you put him on the cross, but because he is who he said he was, his name has power. His name is evidence that he was resurrected, and that's how this guy was made whole. There's a saying uh, in, in the book of Acts summarizing, when in doubt, just preach the resurrection. If, you, if you're in doubt, just talk about Jesus. Talk about the resurrection. And that's what Peter is doing. And then, look, again, as he's done before, verse 11, he points to Old Testament prophecy. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. This is the stone. This is from Psalm 118. Um, you rejected him but he's become the chief cornerstone. He's trying to, again, tie the minds of the people to these scriptures they knew so well and get them to wake up to the reality of exactly who Jesus is and who he was. Then verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other, what? Name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now there's an interesting play on words that takes place in this passage that you wouldn't catch in English. But back in verse, um, back in verse 9, when, when he's talking about the man who's being made well, there's the Greek word sodso. Sodso. Uh, which means to heal or to save. So they're wondering, well, how did this guy get saved? How did he get healed? How did he get sodsoed? And Peter answers the question, how he got so, so he got healed through the name of Jesus. But then at the end of this mini speech, look at what he says in verse 12. Nor is there salvation, that's soteria, soteria, uh, soteriology is, is the study of salvation, and, under any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that's the Greek word again, sozo. So now he's using it not in the healing sense, but in the saving sense. So he's saying, this guy was made well by the name of Jesus. He was sowed, sowed, healed by the name of Jesus. And if you want to be saved eternally, sowed, sowed, it has to happen by that same name, the name of Jesus. By the way, when Jesus comes back to save us from this world of sin, the presence of sin, uh, he's not only going to save us, he's going to heal us too. Um, and I am looking forward to that, and you guys, I know, are looking forward to that also. All of us, we're praying for family, we're praying for friends, we're praying for people. 
Well, one day Jesus will bring all types of healing that we need. So this is a pretty exclusive claim. You can't be saved through the name of Buddha, Mohammed. You can't be saved through Confucius. It's only through the name of Jesus. Now, we believe that that name is so powerful that that there may be people in heaven and, and probably will be who didn't have the opportunity to hear this name. Um, John chapter 1, Christ is the light that lightens every person's heart that comes into the world. And so there may be people who are sincere in their other faith, uh, who didn't have the opportunity, but they were following God in their own hearts. But if they are saved, it's not because of some other name. It's only because of the name of Jesus. Uh, And the more opportunity that someone has, the more light that someone has, the more truth that someone has, the better chance they have of accepting the name of Jesus. Amen. You accept his name? Yes. Amen. So it's only through his name. Salvation only comes through Jesus. And if anybody makes it there, when we all make it there, it will only be because of his name, Uh, not because of my name or your name or someone else's name, only through his name. Look at the response. Verse 13, now when they saw the what? The boldness of Peter and John. Now what did John say in this speech? Now he may have said something, but I don't read it here. But you know what this tells me? You can be bold and keep your mouth shut. Right? I don't know if you've ever been going door to door and maybe there's someone more experienced. It takes boldness to be the prayer partner that just stands there, smiles and nods and prays. So boldness might look different for different ones of us. But God wants all of us to use and experience his boldness. Amen? So John was bold also. And when they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they hadn't gone through the regular schools, uh, the rabbinic schools, they hadn't gotten that type of education. And then it says, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Now we often look at that and we say, oh wow, that's amazing. Um, I want people to realize I've been with Jesus. Uh, Which we should But for for those on the other side, the people who are thinking these things, they're not thinking, oh, this is great, they've been with Jesus. They're thinking, oh, these guys have been with that troublemaker, right? They've obviously been taught by him. They've obviously been schooled by him. They've They've hung out with him. They talk like him. And in their minds, it was a bad thing. But in heaven's eyes, this was the best possible thing. It may be that our family and our friends because of our time with Jesus, they may want to spend less time with us. Uh, And that's a sad reality. Now, they may want to spend less time with us because we think we've been spending time with Jesus, and we haven't, right? We don't want to be one of those Christians baptized in lemon juice. Amen? Because there are some people, and we're all at risk of this, but there are some people who think they are doing things in the name of Jesus and they're really self-deceived. We need to have the boldness of God. Boldness doesn't mean brashness and rudeness, by the way, right? It doesn't mean I got to beat you over the head with my Bible until you submit. Boldness can be a lot of different things. It can be saying powerful and direct things in the name of Jesus, or it could be standing as a silent witness in the name of Jesus. And it's interesting, by the way, they were accused previously of being drunk earlier, right? And we talked about how how alcohol is sometimes called spirits, right? Uh, But it wasn't alcoholic spirits, it was the Holy Spirit that was upon them. Well, sometimes alcohol is also called liquid courage, Right? I was at my friend's wedding one time, uh, and, you know, they weren't in this sort of circle. Uh, and so we were at the reception, and, and it was not like potluck. I'll just put it to you like that. 
And there was a certain song that my friends from high school, they wanted to dance to this certain song. And this wasn't my scene, but uh, my friend, I remember him saying, I got to drink a cup. I got to have a couple more drinks in me before I can do that one. Right? He needed more liquid courage or uh, lack of inhibition before he would do what he did. From my perspective, it looked kind of silly. Uh, but they, you know, they were just having a good time. Don't confuse counterfeit courage for true courage, right? The boldness that God wants to give us is not a boldness that we wake up from with regrets from the previous night. It's not a boldness where we wake up with a tattoo we, we hadn't planned on getting the previous day. <laughs> My dad and I were talking to this lady, and she says, I never regret anything. I never regret anything. And she said, because whatever I did, that's exactly in the moment what I wanted to do then. And so how could I regret it from the future? And we're thinking, well, you could still wish you had chosen something in a previous moment differently, right? So there's different kinds of boldness in our world. But the boldness of God is not one that's rude and abrasive or, or one that causes you to make choices you wish you hadn't made. The boldness from God is when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you say or do what the Holy Spirit wants you to do in that moment. And so the people, they recognized something had happened here. Verse 14, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with him, this guy had become a follower too. They could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred among themselves. 16, saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, a notable miracle has been done through them. It's evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. It was obvious something special had happened. This guy, for 40 years, he had been there. Everybody recognized him. By the way, Jesus promised in Luke 21, verse 15, he says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. This is a fulfillment of that promise. They didn't know what to say. By the way, Jesus said also in Luke 11, or Luke 12, verse 11 and 12, he said, uh, and they bring you into councils, and you have to testify before me. Don't worry about what you're going to say beforehand, for the Holy Spirit will give you utterance. That happened to Peter. And if we're willing, that can happen to us too. And maybe it's not, probably not, brought in before 71 people uh, in this kind of setting, but maybe it's in a conversation with your friend or your coworker or somebody else you bump into at the store. By the way, last week I talked about how if you don't have glow on you, you can't share it, right? And it doesn't have to be glow, but if you don't have something to share, you don't have anything to share. So I was trying to practice what I was preaching, so I went into the Safeway and I took some glow with me. And while I was talking to the lady who was um, checking out the goods that I was buying, uh, she said, oh, yeah, I get bored at work. I said, oh, bored? Well, here's something for you to read if you get bored today. So we got to be ready for those kinds of opportunities. But if we're not preparing now, we won't be ready later. Uh, if we're not spending time in God's word, in prayer, asking for the Holy Spirit now, there's no guarantee later we will have this kind of experience. So they didn't know what to do. But, but, but verse 17, they say, But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man about this name. It doesn't even name the name. It just says, this name. Christianity now has become illegal. Remember, my dad used to say, if, if witnessing was illegal, it might be more popular. Um, hey, let's go do something a little bad. Let's go witness. <laughs> but it's so free and easy. We take things for granted. Verse 18, so they called them, <clears throat> and they commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Those are some powerful words. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That's what a witness does. They just say what they saw, they say what they heard. So if we want to have something to say, we need to be seeing things and experiencing things. And one of the most basic ways to do that is spend time in 
the word, spend time in prayer, uh, and then get out and share it in some way or another. Verse 21, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of all the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Powerful. Now let's look at the last section here, the response with the believers. They go, verse 23, being let go, they went to whom? They went to their own companions. They went back together with their friends. They reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And then, what did they start doing in verse 24? They start praising God and praying. You know, there is power in collective prayer. Would you agree? I mean, there's power in personal prayer, but there's also power in collective prayer. And if you don't have opportunities for that, uh, you do. Today, right after church, in the committee room here, if you want to pray together about anything that's on your heart, um, there'll be people here for a while to just pray with you. Uh, we meet together on Wednesdays at 7 for prayer. Uh, and we even have it on Zoom. If you can't make it in person, you can hop on Zoom. Uh, it's not as easy to hear as it is in person, but you can still kind of catch more or less what's going on. Uh, and by the way, you can do something on your own. It doesn't have to be church-sponsored. You can call up a friend. By the way, a small group is just at least three people. You can have your own small group. You, two other people. That's a small group. And you can pray together on the phone. You can text each other. Uh, there are so many different ways that this can be done. So they get together and they pray together and notice what they say. They raised up their voice to God with one accord and they said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, do those words sound familiar at all? Where are these words from? Who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. This is from the Sabbath command. They're quoting the fourth commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. I had read this multiple times, never noticed that until I saw it somewhere this week in my reading. Verse 25, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the peoples plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. They're now quoting Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2. Um, which there's some evidence that some Jews, certain circles of Jews, viewed this as a messianic prophecy, even before Christ. But now the early Christians are looking at these words and they're saying, wow, these words, they fit our times. They fit our times, the nations and, and the people plotting vain things. And they could think about the people in their local situation for whom these words applied. And they saw how they'd conspired together against the Lord and against Christ. Verse 27, for truly against your holy servant. And we saw that as a prophetic uh, call out from uh, Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 53. Uh, Jesus as this suffering servant, the servant of God. The one whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with Gentiles and with the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined beforehand to be done. Now, some Bibles here use the word predestined. Predestination is simply God's plan based upon his um, prior knowledge of what our free actions will be. So God uses his ability, and I don't have this ability, uh, and you don't either, but God can look into the future and see what creatures will freely choose to do, and then he can make a plan based upon what he sees in advance. And that way, there, there's no freedom of choice that is revoked or inhibited, um, and God can make the best possible plan knowing what, what will occur. And if we would choose something else, then God would make a different plan based upon what our different choice would be. And so they're talking about how great God is, um, who made all things, um, seeing fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And now look at verse 29, their request. Now, Lord, 
look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all what? Boldness they may speak your word. They didn't ask for victory over their enemies. They didn't ask that Caiaphas and Annas get sick and die. They just said, give us boldness. Because now it's illegal to lift up the name of Jesus. And so they said, okay, God, the stakes have been raised. Give us boldness. Give us boldness. Verse 30, by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of the Holy Servant Jesus. May we not only have boldness, but may there continue to be signs done through the name of Jesus. Last verse, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with what? The Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God. How? With boldness. Again, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is not only love, joy, peace, etc., but also boldness. Now, this was not a second Pentecost. It was not a second outpouring in that way, but it was a second boost that they needed. And God wants to give you the boost that you need this week. I find that a lack of boldness often holds me back from sharing Jesus like I want to. And again, I'm not saying boldness means that you have to get a bullhorn and go into your workplace and... Listen up, all you sinners! <laughs> I mean, God may call someone to do that, but probably he's going to work through a more winsome way through you. But what would you do this week for God if you had the boldness from the Holy Spirit that he wants to give you? If God's Spirit came upon you this week, what would you do for him to be bold? It might look like a phone call. It might look like talking to your neighbors. It might look like, uh, I don't know, any number of things. What would you do for him? By the way, there's a very fascinating verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 34, where it's talking about people um, who, who did big things for God, and it says that they became valiant in battle. They didn't get valiant and brave and bold necessarily before battle, but when they went out for battle, that's when they got brave. You'll recall when the Israelites were, were going to cross over the Jordan carrying that Ark of the Covenant, the waters didn't part until they stepped into the water that, that parted in front of them. So we're deceiving ourselves if we're thinking, okay, I'm just going to lay back on my couch, and uh, when the Spirit moves me this week, then that's when I'll be bold. And if I don't get that moving from the Spirit, then it's God's fault, right? Well, I would have done something, God, but you didn't move me. No, boldness is praying and then planning. What can I do for you, God? I don't have the courage right now, but as I go forward, give me the courage that I need. I want to be more bold for God this week. How about you? I've shared this story before, but it's fitting to close with. Um, my dad had business that he did in China, and whenever he'd go to China, he'd like to bring something religious that he could take and share. And, and they'd print glow tracks in, in Mandarin, and so he would, he would take little glow or, or, or different books uh, that he could share. Uh, and I don't know if it was presumption or if it was boldness, but one of his last trips over there, he just took a whole box, put it in his suitcase and said, it's been fine going through security so far, but this kind of stuff is illegal. Um, and, you know, he could get into a lot of trouble. Well, on this trip, as the, the suitcase was going through the scanners, you know, the people behind the monitor looked and they said, oh, you know, look at this, and, you know, we need to take a look at this. You've probably had that experience before if you've flown. Oh, I don't have to look. Oh, it's this thing. Okay, you're fine. 
Uh, but it takes, it takes a while. Well, anyways, they pulled his bag aside. They pulled him aside, opened it up, and there's this box, and it's clearly religious material. And they, they take him into a side room. And this is not good. Um, you've heard, you know, stories and, and what they can do. You know, they probably wouldn't throw, throw him in prison necessarily as a U.S. citizen, but they could. Um, so he's in this room, and there, there are these workers and authorities, and they're looking at this box, and all of a sudden, my dad had this boldness that I think could best be explained by the Holy Spirit. Because he just went up to them, he closed up the box, he said, it's fine. Grabbed the box and walked out. And they didn't do anything to stop him. And he got his bag and he just left. Now, if you know TSA in America, you don't just do that. And in China, you don't just do that. But sometimes when the Spirit comes on you, when the Spirit uh, falls upon you, the Spirit will give you the boldness you need um, to do what he calls you to do. And that may look different for every one of us this week. But this week, I want God to use me. Is that your desire also? I need more of that boldness from God. So let's talk to God as we close. Lord, we are so thankful that you're good. You love us. You want to use us. Not only for, for the people that can be reached through us, but you want to use us for our own sake, for our own salvation. It's good and necessary, uh, not that we're saved through witnessing, but we are so encouraged and we're kept uh, praying and, and reaching out to you when we do things for you. So this week, Lord, I pray that you will help us to not only sense opportunities, but make opportunities where, where we're put in positions where you need to fill us and fall upon us and make us bold for you. Grow the church, grow our faith, and please come back soon, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.